As students are getting ready for the school year with school supplies and schedules, school officials and emergency management personnel are getting ready in a much different way. Sabit Abbasi with the DuPage County Office of Homeland Security and Dr. Bob Rammer from District 200 are here to talk to us about these matters. Thank you for being here. Good afternoon, Susan. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. What are some of the types of emergencies that schools prepare for? Well, schools are certainly concerned and probably our prime directive in all schools and certainly in District 200 is to provide a safe and orderly environment where students can learn. So one of the primary responsibilities is to make sure our schools are um, in well-kept conditions and that we provide for as many safety potentials as we can possibly anticipate. So many of the standard emergency issues are foremost in our minds. Fire drills, tornado drills, um, lockdown in case there are community um, situations that require us to uh, keep our students safe, and then the ever-present, uh, the intruder drills um, are things that we are con conscientious and concerned about as we work with our children to be uh, safe in our schools and staff to be um, prepared for as many potential disasters as possible. Okay, Sabat, can you talk about, are there any federal or state requirements um, that dictate any of these preparedness plans? There are a number of uh, mandates uh, where schools are required to meet certain criteria and, and uh, accomplish certain tasks, such as uh, conducting fire drills and, and, and tornado drills. Um, we'll have more information on our website, so if residents are interested, they could go on there and take a look at the specific things. And then also reaching out to their school district officials to find out exactly what's happening at, at their school. I'd be interested to find out how does DuPage County work with Wheaton's police and fire departments um, as far as school safety is concerned? Now, typically with uh, the Wheaton School District, they will work with their local emergency management agency. And because we are at the county level, we will, get, uh, we will work with them when invited on a much larger scale incidents. And for the most part, they're phenomenal with working with their uh, school districts and the local fire departments and the police departments. And so if a need comes, we may go uh, provide subject matter expertise or sh uh, provide, uh, shadow th what they're doing. Uh, we may uh, be playing as uh, exercise evaluators and a variety of different things. So whatever they need, we're there to support them. And you'd get involved in more of a larger scale incident? Would that be more where you'd work together? Mm -hmm. And even smaller scales, I mean, essentially wherever, wherever they need us, we'd be happy to provide our, uh, our assistance, uh, whether it's small-scale uh, drills or large-scale incidents. But we have a 24-7, there's always someone on call as a duty officer, so if a need comes, they know, they know the number to call. Now, are these preparations made on a regular basis? Are you meeting with them on a regular basis? We typically do, um, but uh, like I said, the local emergency management agency takes the lead on working with the school districts and the fire departments, uh, so I'd have to defer you to uh, him to answer. Okay. Um, do you have any examples of when your emergency planning has been put into place as far as school safety is concerned? We, um, we can think of, I can think of an example where, you know, if there's an intruder uh, detection where the police have notified that there's something that's happening in the community, then at that point that the plan is uh, taking place where the, the school could go and lock down. And for us, we may get an alert from the local police department saying, you know, such and such is happening. And then we may start doing our situational awareness and making the notifications on our side. Um, but at the same time, we'd be in constant communication with the local officials as to what's happening and whatever assistance we can provide to them. Okay, Dr. Raymond, do you have any examples of um, how your plans have been put, put into place as well? Uh, absolutely, Susan. Um, we've had a number of community situations, particularly um, over the past several years, um, where we've worked with our local uh, first responders, um, and they've interacted also at the county level. Um, we're fortunate in District 200, we have a, a district safety committee, which is comprised of first responders from all the communities um, where we have schools. We have representatives, certainly in the Wheaton area, Chief Fields, the police uh, chief, sits on our committee, Commander Volpe, um, also from the Wheaton Police Department, Chief uh, Bill Schultz from our fire department, and their counterparts in Winfield and Warrenville, along with administrators and staff, sit on this district um, safety committee that helps review our plans, um, plans for training, um, and provide us information from um, their um, sources of uh, uh, contact 
and help us improve the things that we do in District 200. Um, this spring, as a matter of fact, there was uh, the police were following a, an intruder that was making his way from another community through our through Wheaton, um, and came close. Uh, they had him cornered close to uh, two of our schools. Uh, they contacted us and said, um, "There's no immediate danger to your schools, but we want you to secure the building and make sure no one comes in or out of your school." Um, and kept us in what we call a lockdown situation until that. Um, that individual was uh, arrested and taken care of and then called us to release. So our interactions, our relationship with our partners um, is probably the best I've ever seen in my career. And as much as our school staff and our school personnel are concerned about the safety of our children, um, it's nice to see that our police and fire department have children um, at the top of their list in terms of providing safety and information to us both um, before, after, and during those uh, community situations. Now, what types of safety measures are put into place in each of your schools? Um, certainly, there are. we have our facilities safety issues, make sure our um, sprinklers are in good condition, our fire extinguishers are in all of those, and all the building codes are taken care of. But we also spend a, a great deal of time um, helping our children and our staff understand um, emergency um, incident situations. We practice fire drills on a regular basis. We practice fire drills. Um, independently, and we also do that with the monitoring of the, the different um, fire departments in our different jurisdictions um, to oversee how we do those to make sure that we're doing them right and to help us improve those things that need to be improved. We do our um, uh, emergency drills for tornadoes um, to make sure that um, we know the best place for our children to be should a tornado strike in this area, and then communicate with our first responders as they communicate with other people around the country about the best practice for our uh, to implement in our district. Um, we also do um, lockdown drills um, regularly with our students and staff to help them learn about um, in case we have to um, keep um, students from wandering the building or exiting or entering the building and how to conduct that. And then we also do that with our, um, our police department um, who check our buildings regularly to see if they're secured, if doors are, um, are open, or if they can enter the building unannounced um, to make sure that we're safe in doing things properly. Um, and so we do that in all of our buildings um, to be as prepared as we can for the various opportunities that may present during the course of a school year. Are those plans specific to each school and their you know, special circumstances? Certainly. Um, the, the plans are, are pretty universal, and they are the same kinds of safety plans for all of our schools, whether it's our early childhood center at Jefferson or to both of our high schools. What differs is how we communicate with our students based on a three- or four-year-old or a 17- and 18-year-old, or the unique configurations of those buildings. Obviously, a building the size of Wheaton North or Wheaton Warrenville South have different uh, demands and different complications. Um, than a small building like Hawthorne or Jefferson. But the general protocols that our staff follows to make sure our children are safe are universal throughout our district. Now, one drill that I think many parents may have questions about because um, parents nowadays probably did not have these type of drills is um, if there was an active shooter or a, a lockdown, as you're saying. Can you talk a little bit about what parents should know about what happens and what they prepare for? Yeah, I, I think one of the, you know, that is a concern, and be, uh, certainly because of the publicity we see nationally um, and the occurrences we've seen in, in schools around the country, that is a, a heightened concern to everyone, our, um, our, um, our police and fire departments, our staff, and parents as well. Um, I, I think what's important um, for parents to know is that um, we work real hard to make sure our children are safe. Um, and although we may not share the specifics of what we do, obviously for, for obvious reasons, um, that we make decisions based on um, the best information we have to make sure children are safe and protected, whether it's an external um, threat or an internal threat um, within those buildings. And we practice that with our children um, to make sure they're comfortable without frightening them. And that's a, a, a delicate balance. Um, there was a time a number of years ago um, when I was uh, first getting into this um, business where we were doing these drills regularly and there were times where um, children became frightened because it was um, scary for them and they didn't feel safe in their schools. And so we've learned that we need to uh, moderate those um, training situations so that students understand what they need to do without being afraid to come to school because of something bad's going to happen. So it is a, an interesting balance. And 
it's part of that communication process we have with children at different levels based on their maturity um, and the nece necessity of what they need to know. Now, do you work with all the schools on their drills and um, what they need to be doing with each specific school as part of the planning committee? Yes, as a matter of fact, um, each year um, that planning committee will meet uh, when school begins and review the emergency, all of the emergency plans of all our schools which includes how many buses are needed for a school in case there's a need for an evacuation. If there were um, a gas leak, for example, or a water leak, um, we had a um, um, facilities problem at Edison a couple of years ago and we had to evacuate the building. Well, each building needs a plan that says we need X number of buses and where they're going to go for um, their off-site placement. So those plans are reviewed by these experts on our, com on our safety committee and then changes are made and, and returned back to the principals for implementation. We do that annually. In addition, during the course of the year, we meet monthly with this committee. And based on things that have changed nationally or what we may hear from the, uh, the county experts, um, those plans can be modified based on um, situations that change. Um, two years ago, we talked about earthquake safety um, because there were some earthquakes that occurred in, in our area, and we learned that that Illinois is not immune from the earthquake that we always think happened in California. And so um, infuse the earthquake preparedness into our safety plans in the middle of the year um, just to make sure that we were ready for those. So um, the, the benefit, again, is of meeting monthly is to review those plans and change any things that need to happen and then take a look at things that we need to improve on as we've learned from our, uh, from our expert partners in this, uh, in this field. If I may add, sure. you know, in terms of the parents being involved, uh, it could be as simple as if a, if a parent changes, uh, if they move somewhere, if they change their place of working, is ensuring their contact information is updated with the schools so that they can receive the information and it's, it doesn't get lost. And those are the little simple things that parents can do from home. And also talking to the children, you know, finding out what the status is, what's happening, oh, what kind of drill ha have you done? and maybe taking that as an opportunity to practice those drills at home so that they're prepared at home. Um, so that's something that parents can, can work with their kids on. Oh, that's an excellent point, Robert. With the, the social media and the ability to communicate, you know, we've, we've learned that that has been a benefit. In some cases, it, it's a hindrance because information gets out that's inaccurate and, and provides sometimes right. it provides a little uh, some chaos. Um, but we're able to communicate with parents um, through voicemail, through text, um, through social media, but we need to have the correct information. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes parents say, oh, I didn't get the message, and then when we've checked, they, uh, there's a different email or they've changed accounts or a phone number. And so um, we have a, what's called Parent View, which is the parent's connection electronically to the district, and they can go in and make sure that those emergency contact information is up to date and, and accurate so that if we need to contact them for whatever reason, we can get to them quickly. And what are some of the primary ways that you get in touch? If there's an incident at a school, how would you put out the message? Um, we would do it uh, through text messages, um, also do it through email. And we also have the ability to do voice communications with all our parents. Um, we would put it up on our, uh, we have Twitter feeds at our school, and then certainly on uh, the more traditional on the website. Um, and so we try to um, maximize the contact with parents because the day when everyone simply had a telephone and that was the only way to do it, we now know people look at different communication devices based on their individual needs. So we try to, to maximize that contact to let parents know what's going on, um, whether it's a late bus or whether we've had to hold children in school because of a severe weather issue. Um, we, that has been a benef benefit to us without parents wondering what's happening. We can get to them as quickly as we can. And that's from official sources also. You know, as you mentioned with social media, the information can get out there quickly. And at the same time, misinformation can get out there. So to be able to get official information from the school and from the police, fire, and even our office, that's important, is identifying those uh, Twitter feeds, those handles. Uh, where can they get those uh, that information? Uh, start taking those steps now so that you've got those, uh, you know, you're either connected to their Facebook page, you know, you follow them on Twitter and, you know, subscribe to them uh, through their local text alerts and things of that nature. So start doing that now before, you know, something does happen, right. unfortunately. If, if there's a family that is not on the Internet or anything, um, could they call the district office or their school? 
to Absolutely. Get, make sure everything's updated. And Absolutely. Would you recommend that all parents go now and check the parent view and make sure all of their stuff is? I, I think that's a good idea. As as we are registering students for the year, one of the registration processes is to go on and verify your contact information, um, and so that it, it is accurate because it changes and sometimes. I just forgot to notify whatever it happened right. to be. So I think um, one of the nice things about starting school each year is that we have an opportunity to, to look at that information annually to make sure it's correct and accurate. Well, so I'd be interested to hear about um, what work you do with the schools and do you go into schools? What is your um, role with directly with the schools? Now, in terms of directly working with the schools, like you know, like I said, if if, a, if it's in an unincorporated area, then they would reach out to us directly because we would be their point of contact. But if it's a municipality like the city of Wheaton, they have their local emergency management coordinator, um, and then they would reach out to them. For us, we would you know we may participate in exercises. So if they are hosting an intruder or active shooter drill, um, then we may participate in that. Uh, but at the same time, if there's any information that the school district or the police or fire department would like to share uh, with the county and the residents throughout, we have our official channels of communication that uh, the residents in DuPage County follow. So if it, it could be as simple as them sharing the message with us and then we then sharing it with the residents. Um, so it just really depends on what the, what the school is doing. Okay. Dr. Raymer, a lot of incidents involve severe weather. Um, if something happens during the school day, what are some of the things that parents can do that would help or not help the situation? Um, one of the things that, that we've learned through experience is, is I think as Savit mentioned, um, is to wait to hear the official information that we have. Certainly in District 200, the, given the, the size of the district, weather can be significantly different from the north side to the south side or east and west. And so where one building may be having a, a weather issue, another building may be just fine. Um, and when people listen to um, uh, forecasts on, on television or even their apps, those are kind of general descriptions of what's going on, and it may not be specific to a particular building. So we would encourage parents to um, wait and listen to our, um, our, our information notice that we know um, and not come to the school until we've indicated either an all-clear or that we are releasing students early for some reason. Um, you know, sometimes parents get concerned, and we certainly understand that and appreciate that. We're, you know, we're, we're taking care of their most precious, uh, precious commodity, their children. Um, and sometimes when, they, when a lot of people come to school, it keeps us from doing the things we need to do in terms of maintaining safety. Um, and I think when, one of the things that I hope parents understand is that we will make decisions to protect their children as best we can given the information we have. So wait till you hear from us. If we want you to come pick up your children early, we will tell you. Um, if they're coming home normally on the bus, we will tell you that as well. Um, and if there are other issues, we're going to communicate that out as quickly as possible. But we, but we do want to wait for the accurate information. And it may be different. It's simply in neighboring schools may be different depending on you know, the, the direction of the wind and where the weather is coming from. Right. That makes sense. And that brings, you know, to add to that, that brings a good point. So let's say the students are being released early and the, par the parents work a while. For example, my wife, she works in downtown Chicago. So for her to be able to come home uh, if something were to happen, it, w it would take a, a while. And I would imagine with other parents that would be the case too. So maybe making those plans ahead of time, you know, a friend, a neighbor, a trusted person who can maybe go pick up the child. And it can't just be anybody. Uh, but obviously, having those plans ahead of time, if the child does get dropped off at home, ensuring that a trusted person is at home to receive that, uh, receive that child. Absolutely. And we wouldn't release, and, and I say early, um, earlier than, than you know, the, the storm gets through. We would not release children to go home unless we were convinced that people were there were available. We would simply keep all the children um, until we were able to contact the home and say, um, is there somebody there uh, to meet Bobby or is there somebody there to do it? We would keep children as long as we needed to and would never um, uh, dismiss students um, before the end of the school day without um, uh, confirmation that uh, someone will be there to take care of them. Okay. For some of these issues, would you suggest parents talk to them, uh, talk to their children about them beforehand just so they kind of have some knowledge of if this were to happen, here's what you should do? Absolutely. You know, now is the time to talk to them as uh, revise the plan, come up with their plans, uh, emergency plans. Uh, so if something needs to be changed, now is the time to do it. Um, as one an example, I provide is contact information. You know, if if a child does not remember the parents' cell phone numbers, how are they going to get a hold of them if they don't have cell phones at work? 
Um, do they have written emergency contact cards in their wallet? I actually keep one myself. As obviously, I remember my wife's phone numbers. I mean, I remember her cell phone number, her boss's number. So I have that information written down in the contact in case I can't get a hold of my wife. I need to contact her boss to find out where she is. Similarly, the parents can do the same thing and work with the children and make sure that information is shared. And I think, you know, psychologists have said it's, it's better to talk to the children and let them know what is happening because especially in this day and age, the information is, the kids, the children can get information from anywhere. So rather than them hearing from inf that information from other people, it's best that the parents talk to them so that they can get official information and actually are hearing from their parents, their most trusted, uh, the per most trusted person. And I think that's also a good opportunity as, as parents hear about drills that go on at school to talk to their children at home about what would we, what do we do at home in case of a mm -hmm. fire or a tornado? Or um, if you were to come home and uh, mom or dad aren't here, where do you go? Who, who are the contact? Where, can you go to your neighbor or what neighbor? And then make those arrangements with them. Um, it's better to, to make children feel comfortable about those issues than after the fact trying to, to, to uh, con console them if something were to happen. So it provides not only um, a comfort for them to know that schools will take care of them, but what would we do, mom, what would we do at home if there were a tornado? What would we do if there were a fire? Um, and so those discussions are good so people are prepared. Right. Now this is a, a little bit different, but um, along the same lines of safety, um, if a student saw something that concerned them, if there was anything unusual, is there a protocol for um, in different schools what students should do? We, we uh, encourage students and, and parents as well um, to tell us if something is not right. If something is out of the ordinary, unusual, please tell us. And we've had very good luck. We have um, police liaison officers at both our high school. Um, that is basically a communication device between um, the community and our students. And we've got a lot of information from students about things that are going on that weren't normal, weren't right, or were um, out of the, the norm, um, where we've been able to take um, appropriate action and, and prevent some situations. Um, whether it's a stranger, that a car in the neighborhood that, that doesn't, isn't familiar, or uh, somebody who's approached a child in the community, if they tell an adult quickly, we can take action and the, the first responders and the police can take action to, to make sure that, and find out whether it is dangerous or whether it's an innocuous situation. And so what we tell all our children is, if you're uncomfortable, tell an adult. And we tell our parents the same thing. Call the police, call us, don't worry about it. We would rather you make the call a hundred times than not make the call once and something should happen. We're never bothered with those calls. We're never bothered with those questions. And we would rather know about it um, than you wonder about it. And I know Chief Fields and, and Commander Volpe feel the same way. If there's ever a question about the community or about what's going on, they want the community and school district, for example, to call 911 and let them know about it. Better to be safe than sorry. Right. Now, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about colleges. Um, now, this obviously doesn't necessarily <laughs> affect District 200, but can you talk a little bit about campus safety for colleges? Are there any other concerns um, that you can share with us? Similar to the concerns that they have in school, they apply for colleges. And there are a number of programs and uh, grants and training opportunities that, are, that is available to colleges and college personnel from public safety and even other administrative uh, fo uh, people that work at the college so that they can receive the training and know exactly what to be prepared for. Uh, so someone from the administrative side, they may not be involved in the public safety, but at least they are aware of what to, what to look for. And um, there's, uh, by the Illinois Emergency Management Agency has a program called the Ready Campus, and that's a designation which uh, colleges and universities can apply for which basically that, to kind of pro provide a summary of it, you, uh, the, uh, the schools need to complete certain tasks and uh, it's a checklist, it's an application, they need to complete certain tasks and as they complete that, then they may be awarded uh, the ready campus designation. Uh, and that, you know, that information can be found on our website at Protect You page. There's a link to it where people can go and learn more about it, especially the school officials. 
Well, and it, it's interesting as you talk about colleges. We have a, a partnership relationship with Wheaton College, as a matter of fact. Okay. Um, each of our schools has a designated location in terms of evacuation. Mm -hmm. um, and so where can, where can our schools go if we need to evacuate? And sometimes we can take one school and put it to another. And, but in some cases, um, that's not going to work. And so we do have a relationship with Wheaton College where we can use their facility in case of an emergency to evacuate students to um, pit places on their campus. Um, and so, um, again, this partnership that we have in this in District 200 community, and again, including Carroll Stream and Winfield and, and Wheaton, um, is, is second to none in terms of people willing to work together. Um, we work with the Park District equally in terms of can, could we evacuate a school to one of the Park District facilities if we had to for some reason. And so those reciprocal relationships and agreements um, are powerful. And we also work with our, our local um, emergency management um, uh, group um, headed by Bill Schultz, the, the fire chief, um, where, our, where our schools can be used in case of a community disaster, where our gymnasiums could, for example, be turned, over, turned into um, housing areas for a short period of time, depending on when it occurred. Um, and so that give and take and that bonding here um, is really, um, should be comforting for the people that live in our communities. Okay, that's fantastic to hear. So many different agencies are working mm -hmm. together and have plans in place. Now, um, as we kind of wrap up, what would you think, I'd like to hear from each of you, kind of what the most important message you think parents should take away from this? Do you want to start, Sabit? Sure. One of the most important messages that I would encourage parents to take is start planning for emergencies now rather than waiting for the time or rather than waiting to hear from school. There, there are steps parents can take uh, to plan. And there are a number of resources available. And I, and I keep talking about our website. I brought some coloring books here just to kind of show. We've got a number of coloring books here in, that are, for example, resources available for parents. They can download these and we provide them you know, at different outreach events we go to where parents can take, the, uh, take these coloring books as, or activity books and use this as an opportunity to talk to their children about the different types of disasters and emergencies that can happen. You know, it could be as simple as explaining to, to the children the difference between an, a watch and a warning when they start getting their, their phones. Many, many children have smartphones and they may receive different alerts on their phone. So under, uh, for them to understand, well, what is that tone that I'm hearing? You know, is that a wireless emergency alert that I've just received? And, well, and it says a severe thunderstorm warning. Well, what does that mean compared to a severe thunderstorm watch and the different types of things? So that is one message I would encourage parents is for them to start looking at it and then to be able to educate with their, uh, their children about it also. Great. Dr. Raymer, what would you like District 200 parents to take away from this? Um, I think I would only add two little pieces to that. I think Sabit's um, um, cautions are, are absolutely right on, is to have those conversations with children. I think the other thing that we would hope parents would understand is, number one, um, we take the safety of their children seriously. Not only are we um, um, charged with providing reading and writing and arithmetic and all the learning things, uh, but again, our, our prime directive is to have a, a safe environment, and we do that very conscientiously and very seriously. Um, and, and when we make these decisions, they're not cavalier and they're not without great thought and input from the experts. Um, number two, that we have good plans in place to maintain that safety with their children, um, that we work hard to revise those um, and to make sure that they are the, the best possible plans given the, the best practice that we know. And then again, finally, have those conversations with your children to make them feel that school is comfortable and is safe and that they can take some of that information and, and uh, translate it to their home environment to make them um, safe when they're at home as well. Fantastic. Well, I think this has been um, very informative. I think parents will come away with a lot from this. So thank you both for being here. Susan, thank you. It's thank my you pleasure for having us.
Hello, I'm Bob Rammer, Assistant Superintendent for Administrative Services in Wheaton Warrenville District 200. We want to welcome our children back to the schools in the fall, um, and we would hope that parents have conversations with them about the safety procedures that they're using in their home, as well as the safety procedures we will have in place to make sure children have a safe and orderly environment where they can do wonderful things academically and socially in our schools. It's going to be a great year, and we look forward to the great time we're going to have with our children. Thank you.